Bird, 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 bird! Get him, get him, get him, get him! Yeah! <laughs> Round Babe was right! Round Babe was right! I'm feeling, I'm feeling spry. Can you believe it? It is the official. It's, it's, it's September 3rd. Now, I have not pulled the trigger yet, okay? But that's understandable. I didn't have any spots to go goose hunting here. I'm trying to get a trip ready to pack, an epic trip that's damn near going to be a month. And uh, I, I've literally just been packing up, and I realized that I've got everything loaded between the trailer and the truck, I mean, I've got my gum leaf USA boots. I got my Royal Zips in there. I got the canine athlete in there. I've got two weeks or two, two, a month's worth of pro plan. I got one of them in a gunner food crate. Give me a little more weight in the front of the dog trailer. And then another full bag under the top storage lid. I've got my Mossberg. I've got my 1-800 number to DU supply in case something should happen to my Garmin products, which I've never had that problem. But if you do and you call W, they will next day, they will send a Pony Express rider with your transmitter, your collar replacement. They'll help you reset it. Don't ever lose that number for W hunting supply. I've got my, my 300i and my trusty 550 plus for my Garmin equipment. I've got a Gunner Kennel in a truck, Gunner Food Crate in a truck. I've got my Walton Spices. I've got my Boss Shotgun Shells. I've got my Pike Gear all packed. I have got everything except the four-wheel camper, which is where I'm heading to, to Sacramento, to actually Woodland. I know a couple of my listeners are probably going to meet me out there, might do a little dove hunting. That whole trip starts Tomorrow morning, it's going to be epic. And you know who my title sponsor is, my title navigator, my, the, the name of this trip? It's the OnX Journey. <clears throat> yeah, they're my title sponsor. Why wouldn't I name it after them? This is the OnX Journey. I'm going to Sacramento, up to Boise. Boise, we're going we're gonna to do another Behind the Dog film. Did you see the one that just came out? Because it was... It was Really cool. Everybody loved it. Um, check that out, behindadogfilms.com. You can purchase that. It's a measly $4.99, and you are going to learn again about what good breeders, top-shelf breeders do in this country to give us top-shelf dogs. So, I mean, other than well, I am going to meet a couple of my patrons when I'm out in Sacramento. So I, I, what? Kind of, this is just an epic trip, and then another one in Boise. Hey, you know, you know, you know, Troy. Yes, Troy. Troy wants to go camping with me. He bought another brand. But, but we're going to go out and kick the wheels. We're going to be showing off my four-wheel camper all over the country. So, Boise, we're going to do a behind-the-dog film on Bob Ferris and the Poodle Pointer. You, everybody's going to want to watch that one just because it's Bob Ferris. I mean, the, the guy's a, the guy's a, you know, did you ever call him? Well, I'm sure a few of you have. His voicemail, his voicemail is epic. He's epic. I cannot wait to spend a couple days in Boise interviewing, documenting, scanning photos, scanning, and, and just doing a really deep, deep dive into the Poodle Pointers. That's going to be so much fun. It, it, it's the OnX journey. The OnX journey. Is that, come, come up, if you can come up with another good name for it, and that seems like our journey on X. Maybe that's better. We're going to name it something because all the next three weeks worth of podcasts or four weeks are all going to come to you from the road. Got some new recording equipment, some new gear, but it's all made, all made possible because in the beginning, well, in the beginning there was Patreon. That was it. I was like, wow, folks would like to get a little discount on a lot of my products and a lot of my even even Upland Institute. I take care of you. You know, I give you a little wink on the side. But only if you're a Patreon patron. 
I don't know what to tell you. This is going to be, I am 2,000, what is it, 2,062 miles door to door for my first leg of my journey. It's a haul. I haven't, I haven't made that trip since I was, oh, in fact, I can tell you how old I was. I was 20. I was not old enough to go into a casino when I went through Vegas. We were going down to L.A. to do a rack job, actually a rack welding job with my buddy Jimmy Karras. This was way back in the day. And I had a, I had a Ford van, and my boss gave me a big gas-powered Miller welder, a 50-pound box of welding rod, and I had to go out and make a bunch of metal beams or, or steel rack beams. I had to make them code for the state of California because they're damn earthquakes, right? So me and my buddy Jimmy went out there, and we stopped in Vegas. And guess who couldn't get in? Guess who couldn't get into the casino? Me. They actually carded us. So we did go to an outskirt little gas station casino where they didn't card me. So that's how long ago it was. So I was 20. Wow, 45 years ago is the last time I made a journey this long in one direct drive. I can't wait. I can't wait to talk to you from the road. Watch the Instagram once I get this new four-wheel camper Model M installed on my truck next Friday. <clears throat> You're going to see it in all my Instagram. You're going to see it all over the place. You're going to also, also, you're going to see a dog box. Yeah, a dog box that is being custom made for me. And no, don't, don't think I'm switching kennel. This is not a kennel. This is something because of the four-wheel camper and the top and the way it's made, I'm having a permanent forward, uh, I guess you call it not forward facing, forward, well, way up by the cab. I mean, a custom dog box made by Alder Grove Dog Boxes. So literally, I go Sacramento, get the four-wheel camper installed. Boise, film Bob Ferris. Spearfish, South Dakota, get my dog box installed. Then I'm going to go up through Montana, North Dakota. I'm going to be hunting for two weeks, at least up there. And my stop in Spearfish is to get this dog box in. And what you, you're saying, well, Ron, what are you doing with your dogs? Well... <laughs> I borrowed a dog trailer, had to put some, some new rubber on it, and we checked the bearings and redid the electrical a little bit, but it's up and running. I've been practicing with the dogs in it, making sure it's, it's a – well, if I were a dog, I wouldn't want to ride in a dog bo- in a dog trailer. I'd much rather be in a truck with me. But anyway, we got it weighted down. We think we got it pretty well timed in there. And my buddies, my, my buddies, and I say buddies, Trent and Heather – are going to come over here on their way to North Dakota to meet me. They're going to snag the rest of my dogs, and they're going to snag the dog trailer. So it's got all my extra gear, extra guns. My daughter's flying out. To, it, it's going to be just wait, and there's going to be another HMF. If you didn't see HMF on YouTube, check out HMF. That's hunting mother, and you know what. I try not to swear too often. Anyway, that's it. I mean, we're, I'm, I'm ready to go. I can only thank my Patreon patrons, Onyx, Pipe Gear, Boss Shot Shells, Waltons, Gunner Kennels, Garmin, W Supply, Four Wheel Camper, Mossberg, Purina Pro Plan, K9 Athlete, Gum Leaf, and of course, I thank the Upland Institute because I'm going to tell you all about that on a couple of videos I did. I've got this young dog from my little crossbreeding litter, my accidental litter. Well, I tell you what, I was worried about her, but... I had to consult Justin McGrail. He's like, he's like, he's the wizard, okay? Had a real big problem with this dog, and he says, well, here's something you can do. For sure, I'll talk about it on the next Zoom Room, but you'll probably get some videos of it here in the next couple weeks if you're a Patreon patron. I love you guys. I love you girls. I love you girls more. And, and wait, oh, there was something I, oh, never mind. That's good enough. I'll see you guys soon. Talk to you next week. All right. Hey, everybody. I am on a Zoom call with a fella that it only took me about eight months to corner Ben. His name is Ben Randall uh, from Beggar Bush. And I'm just going to let you kind of do the intro, Ben, because I know most people in the States. I mean, you've been over here in the States before, but you, you work out of the UK and your your specialty is, I would say, Springers, but you've trained Springers and co- or I'm sorry, Cockers. 
but you've trained springers and labs. But your methods and your philosophies, we're going to dig into all that today. So give everybody a little uh, Cliff Notes uh, history of you, and then I've got some questions. Okay, so um, as you said, Ben Randall, nice, nice to meet everybody, and hopefully you'll enjoy this um, enjoy this podcast. So I've um, made springers and cocker champions and trained retrievers for over 30 years. So I train, I'm an A-panel a spinal judge in the UK as well, and I've judged the national championships, um, European championships, um, springers and cockers. So I shoot over my dogs regularly, uh, multiple times a week, once they're trained. Um, I have visited the, the US um, on a few occasions and sent many dogs over there to compete in field trials. Uh, and, and lots of them have won and made champions. So I know the way you train. Um, I like the way lots of you train. Um, do I like the way collars are used by some trainers? Definitely not. Do I think that they're needed? I've proven they're not. In the UK, they're actually banned. So in Wales, which is just across the, the river from me, they are banned. Wow. And UK, the UK, the Kennel Club, the, U, the UK Kennel Club will be banning them in the in the England soon, if not very soon. Yeah. Um, so they are banned for a reason. They get a lot of bad press. Um, I just I just feel like I was trying to explain to you earlier. For those of you that know what trialing is in the in the US, you've got a course of pegs of flags. 50 meters wide, for, for example, two guns left to right on the pegs. You're in the middle. A guy on a quad bite with a chucker dropping a bird out. We've now got to get our dog to quarter in training buckets, but we've got a dog to quarter left, right, all the way to that bird. A really hard flush and sit. The bird gets shot. We're tapped on the shoulder. Send your dog. Clipper. Bang. Straight there, straight back. One thing you're exceptionally good at is your marking, but that's because you've only got one bird normally to flush and retrieve. So as I was explaining to Ron earlier, you need a collar to teach a dog to quarter, mostly bare ground at the start of a trial, because there's not many, there's no natural wild birds in there until you get into like the fourth or fifth series and there's a few knocking around. Right. So you've got limited scent. The course is used sometimes by multiple dogs. So you've got limited scent and you've got one bird to find. So if I give you an example of this morning, for instance, we've got a large commercial pheasant, partridge and duck shoot near me. Um, and they put, I would, I'm guessing, in, in excess of 100,000 birds down. So there's a strip of grass 40 metres wide by 200 metres long. And I had two six-month-old brother and sister and there was in excess of 500 plus birds, young pheasant poults, um, walking in front of us. And we just tapping them up and pushing them back to the main pens where they're going to be flushed from. OK, where right. they're released from. So the gamekeepers want us to get those birds back because they because the cock birds, like the Pied Piper, draw them away. Right. And walk them back to the pens, to the chute, so they can be flushed for the guns. So it's quite a job to get them back every day. So I hunted these two young Spaniels, six month old, seven month old, quartered beautifully, stopped on the whistle, didn't see a bird close up, but there was scent everywhere, as you can imagine. Right. Yeah, those, they're they're yeah. picking it up the whole way. Yeah. Oh, massive. They, they have no idea what it is, but it's driving them insane. But they're still <laughs> turning. They're still stopping. They're still sitting and recalling. I did a few retrieves. Everything was great. Put them away. Nice exposure tested my training methods in that environment and it worked are they ready to be in it every day no but i tested that the, the training how they are as they were today then obviously i got my experienced dogs out <laughs> got a young cocker 14 months old as good as potentially my championship winner um she's a granddaughter of hers she had 30 40 contact flushes off her nose wow. and sat to every flush the birds flushed only flushed very tempting 10 meters in front flat hit the floor and run so even more tempting then i've got to ask her to leave that and hunt on oh. in the same direction right and, and i'm still, still quartering get right back basically lose don't worry about that bird go right back to what you were doing quartering yeah and we find another one 
Yeah. yeah. And then what I what I started doing then is sending them back for a memory retrieve, but um either a dead bird that I found or a dummy I'd shot. Um, I'd flush a bird in front, leave, recall, sit, retrieve behind. And then when I when I knew there was the birds had pushed on in front, I threw some dummies out in front. And they went out and picked bird, a dummy whilst they were flushing other birds, picked the dummy, brought it back to me. Now, if I was to video this and demonstrate this to some of my US clients, and I say to them, but I've done all that without a collar. Without and, you've got, and you've got to flush one bird on one course and you need a collar. Right. Well, some... I, I, yeah. And I, I remember <clears throat> taking four dogs over to America many years ago and I got them out of the crate and I let them have a toilet and let them settle in. And then I went back out and demonstrated them and we shot some pigeons over them. And the young, I had two young dogs and they delivered to hand beautifully. And the American guy, well, how do you get them to deliver? Do you put them on a table with a collar? I said, why would I need to do that? They all deliver naturally because I teach them as a puppy to deliver their heads to my hand. And so that's all they know is when they hear a recall, see my ha hands, they, I call it head to hand. And they just deliver themselves straight to my hand. Okay, so when I put a dummy on the floor, they pick it up and their natural instincts deliver their head to my hand, irrespective of what's in their mouth. And it works naturally. Of course, we have dogs with problems that other trainers have caused in the UK, and we have sure. to fix that. Um, but... There's no, for me, there's just, for my training methods, there's no reason to use it. And I do believe that my Gundog app and the methods I'm using is getting bigger and bigger in the US every month. Yeah. The more, more people that are subscribing to it, the more people are thinking, actually, there's another way of doing this. Right. And I'm like a dog for a decade, not for two years. Right, right, right. Because my champions all retire at about six or seven years old. And I've got a couple of very, very good friends that, that literally are sat there waiting for their lottery ticket, they call it. And <laughs> once they retire, I, get, I give them a champion or a field trial winner. And I say, right, you've got yourself a winner and a champion. Go and enjoy it. It's got to, it's got to live in the house. That's my rule. Yeah. Um, can't, no, no bad methods. And those dogs... I think it's probably about a dozen or so now that have gone through till they're 14 and for up to at least 12 years, they've trained in the field and shot and been family shooting companions and gamekeepers companions, and they've never put a foot wrong. So that's because we've got a mutual respect. And because I'm a, because I'm a human psychologist, I've got two boys, one's 19 and one's 17, and I can hand on my heart tell you if i've got every school report for the last nine well not 19 years because they they stopped work, as soon as they started school right. every report there's not one report that says that they're rude they're naughty they're, in, they're insolent they're bad mannered not one report says that so, so i brought i brought them up right i'm bringing my <laughs> doctors up right it's really right. simple well, it, it it does sound simple and i and i said i i had a couple analogies but i i want you to kind of go over that with like your start with a pup and and it's not, I mean, you, de you deal with, you don't take one pup on for a year. You're doing this with lots of dogs, but when, before we hit the record button early on, on my, the first dog I took to a high level of training, I, I didn't have an e-collar. I had a beeper collar for, so I could find them in the woods when they were pointing a grouse or a woodcock or in heavy grass out West. And we took what was called the green book, which was a NAVDA, uh, basically a training, training book, gave you some ideas. And the methods in there were all without an e-collar. And it was all just working with your dog, in this case, on an elevated platform. I literally steadied this dog before he, I had him steady on things before he would be up, before he ever saw a bird. And I, and I took a slow path. And then I kind of varied away from that and tried to hurry things along, tried to try to try to be proficient with an e-collar. And I wasn't. I, I know there are people who are. <clears throat> and then on my last two dogs, the what I would call my better dogs, um, never had an e-collar on their neck. Now, when they're using when I use a tracking collar, it does have the ability, uh, you know, to, to give them a jolt. But I never trained them with it. So when I went to your, I, I attended a couple of your seminars and I know from interviewing trainers in England, 
that if we could do these all these decades and decades of doing this without that, you know, why did we go to that where what what did we miss? Right. And I think it's because you said, explain how you like start your bonding with the dog. Like, yeah. So so I think um, one thing we've got to say is that the breeds are the breed lines are different in U.S. Sure. Obviously, a lot of your top spaniels will come from our our, our lines over here. Yep. Um, they are the argument will be with my US clients is Ben, you haven't seen dogs like this. They're, they're twice as wide as yours, they're pumped, they're they're on one constantly. And I say to them, look, I'm training, I'm training Jack Russell's, German Shepherds, I'm training pet dogs as well that are highly wired like yours, but I'm not having to use a collar on them. Right. And then when they show me these dogs as youngsters, they're throwing flapping pigeons. And the dogs chasing them as flapping pigeons and grabbing it and, and pegging it and bringing it back because they want that really hard flush. I yeah. get it. I understand why they're doing it. But all they're doing is getting that dog hotter and hotter, more wired, and going to make all the rest of the training harder. So yeah. if, you, if you have a dog, like I'm, my US clients tell me, that's highly wired and highly strung, got loads of power, we do not need to see that power yet. Yeah. Yeah. Develop it. So um at the moment I've got thousands of people all over the world using my methods on seven days a week. Every morning, it's quite humbling. Every morning at seven o'clock in my kennels, I'm feeding my dogs. And thousands of people over the world are feeding them in the same way I'm doing it. They're developing a bond, they're developing the techniques I use, and they're using that. Thousands of people every day with the app are using these techniques. And it's it's amazing when you're in the kennel thinking. I wonder how many people are doing this today. And right. what they're doing, I have a young puppy. Um, and if you look on my Instagram, on Begabush or Gundogat or my Facebook, you will see this last week, I've just recently posted two siblings, a little bitch called Lace, black and white Springer, and a black and white dog called Lenny. And they're six to seven months old. And if you saw what they were doing at that age, they're doing what a two-year-old dog should be doing. They're stopping at... 80 yards on the whistle they're holding the ground they go left and right and people have been messaging me globally asking me how on earth have you done that is that true is it that age i've had to send a few of screenshots of the date of birth and of the pedigree of the dog just to prove a point because they kept they don't believe me but how are they so advanced and how have they got so much drive when you've not let them chase because the drive is in there what i've done is i've developed it and I've built a mutual respect with us both. I've allowed them to, to ex express themselves and, and absolutely give everything they got in every session. But I've learned how to harness that speed and power. So I'm just basically, I'm riding them, I'm harnessing it. Um, I'm having to correct them occasionally, but I'm, I'm harnessing all that speed and natural ability to allow them to get success every time I train them. So I start off, obviously, with their food. I'm teaching them the food training. I'm teaching them to sit for their food for long periods of time. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching them to go left and right for food. I'm teaching them to go back for their food. I'm teaching them to cast from my side. I'm teaching them the stop whistle, the hump whistle, the recall whistle. And all, imagine all, all with the meal time. All every meal time. A puppy is fed three times a day. So... That's three times a day. That's 90 times a month plus you're That's feeding your dog. So yeah. from eight weeks to 12 weeks, I have taught my dog 90 times to sit on a whistle, to heal, to go left and right, forwards and backwards, and hunt whistle. But on top of that, each meal time, if I'm feeding a puppy 100 grams of dry kibble, mm -hmm. I'll give it 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. So now I've taught it five times at breakfast to do something, five times at lunch, five times at dinner time. So now I've taught it 15 times a day, times 30 days. Wow. And that is why my dogs at six months old are so trained. They're, re they're ready to go out and experience the game. Do I let them? No, not really. I still, if I'm honest with you, they don't really have any idea how good they are. They don't know. Well, yeah, it's like seeing this young athlete and he gets a ball and skins everyone and scores. And you think, that kid has no idea how good he is. 
right? We we now need to not, we don't want to tell him how good he is. We need to now bring him back, calm him down and harness him and right. slowly now give him bits. If we give him it too early, he'll think he's too good. He'll yep. think he's unstoppable and we break him. Yeah. And that's what people do with dogs. They got they think they're too good. They train them every day in the field. They shoot with them every day. But what they're forgetting is how many times have I seen someone go out and shoot shoot two, three birds over their dogs every day? And they flush and shoot them and send them. And I say to them, you know, when you flushed it and it's marked it 20 yards away, does it pick it every time? Yeah, every time, Ben, it's perfect at it. I said, why do you keep practicing it then? <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you send it for the bird and stop it halfway, call it back to you, go and pick the bird at yourself? Why don't you shoot a bird at 12 o'clock in front of you and send it for another bird to the left, a blind that you've put down? I never thought of that, Ben. <laughs> I said, well, you'll, get, you'll get asked to do that in a trial. Not everyone will shoot a bird. They might miss it. And your right. dog's mark is landed. And your dog's fixated on it. And in your dog's mind, dad yeah. always sends me that. That, no, yeah, that's, that. Yeah, that dog, that's all that dog knows. Flush bang out back. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Why, yeah why, for instance, another human psychology, my sons are very, very proficient at rugby and they're very good at passing off their right hand. But their left hand was very poor when they were younger. So we spent eight weeks in the school summer holidays passing off our left hand every day until the left hand was near enough as good as her right hand. And it's been good right the way through. So I saw a weakness and I said, why are we practicing the good stuff? Well, you you're can already, do it. You're already good with your right hand. Let's, yeah. with your left Let's hand. get good with both. Yeah. And it made a massive difference in their careers. And with my dogs, I've got one dog at the moment for example, which is, I think, as good as uh, as good as a championship winner. And she won the championships back-to-back, Holly Betch Fatty. She's the most famous cocker for nearly, well, just over 50 years now in the UK, in the world of cockers. And I've got a bitch I think is more exciting, faster, and potentially could go on to win more. Whether she'll win it, make that history, I doubt it. Um, but potentially she could. And the other day, she's just starting to come into season slightly. I think her hormones are changing. She just, when I sent her right the other day, she didn't go right. She ran back to me. And I know it's a hormone thing. So what I've done, I've just broken down her training. I've said to myself, right, I know you could do it before your hormones changed, but I'm presuming it is that, or you, you're not getting, you're not getting confused. So now I'm going to sit you up. I'm going to break it all down. So I've been doing lots of videos recently on Instagram and posting things with my clients about breaking the retrieve down. So I'm, at the moment, I'm just teaching her in every different environment I can think of to go left and right. And she knows it's there because she can see it or she's seen it thrown. So yeah. every time I send her left and right, she does it. So I spent 10 days teaching her perfect lefts, perfect rights, perfect backs. Took her out this morning on all those birds, did every left and right I asked her to do. Yeah. I just rebuilt her confidence up again. So she trusted me implicitly that it was going to happen. Um, and again, uh, look, I'm not on here to say you shouldn't use collars. I'm not going to tell anyone not to do something. I think people have got to make their own minds up in the, in life. Um, it would be wrong of me. Uh, my opinion is you don't need them. Yeah. But I'm not going to impart my opinion on people um, like some activists do in this world. I'm not going to mention why, who they are, but they mention the different theories and things. So, And that's their view and no one else has an opinion. I think other people have opinions and I've l listened to those opinions, watched those and watched their actions. I think the best way I can prove that it's not needed is in my actions and my dog's performances. Right. So right. that's why, I, that's why I post videos all over my app. I post videos all over the U UK and worldwide for people to see my dogs in action at various ages. And I put their ages down so people can get an understanding, right? There's Ben's dog. It's bred this way, sire and dam, it's seven months old. Ben's going to show us what it can do. They might, they might think it's no good. They might think, wow, that's incredible what that dog can do. Very impressive. Then I'll show it to them in like two months' time, and they'll see how it's advanced in that time. I'm not hiding anything. I'm showing people. I'm right. doing all this without the use of a collar, without the use of bullying and being a pack leader. I'm doing it with mutual respect and trust. 
and I'm doing it without bribery, but with reward. So I don't bribe my children to do something. They do it because we're a partnership. Yeah. They help me, I help them. You know, I, I could I, I, I could develop like 10 questions out of listening to that. And I couldn't agree more. And and I've said this many times on my podcast. We have a, a training club with our uh, versatile dog club. And I can't tell you how many times a new member comes. We always tell them to make sure that the puppy has shots and everything before they come out. Right? But every once in a while, somebody will like, hey, I got my dog. I just wanted to say hi to everybody. And I'm going to be training this year. And I can't tell you how many times, literally, a, a stranger, because they don't know anybody there at the club yet, will ask that person with an 8, 12-week-old, 14-week-old dog, has your dog seen a bird yet? To your point, right? And yeah, yeah. and I'll if I hear it, I'll intervene. And it, it's a very sarcastic version of the same thing. I ask them, because I always get the questions like, when does my dog need to see birds? And I said, did your dad let you see a Playboy magazine when you were in kindergarten or did he figure you were going to like it when you hit puberty? Yeah. Right. I mean, good analogy. Good analogy. It, I, I mean, it, it's the same thing. It's overstimulation. Right. And yeah. that's what you're and, avoiding. And, you you, and you, you're not mentally ready to accept it or right. understand it. So you, right. you like kindergarten, you don't go to a strip club. It, it's right. 18, 21 on the door for right. a reason. Right. And even then, we could probably say twenty five would be a better age. <laughs> Actually, that's one that's one thing I did enjoy about Chicago. <laughs> but we won't go into that. But I did enjoy that. I didn't, okay. and they love they love my English accent. But you, but you weren't in kindergarten. You were a grown man. <laughs> I was twenty plus. Yeah, I was twenty plus. 20 yeah. plus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I think like the takeaway is so much that you can do to create that bond with your dog, and I, I. I've heard you talk because I attended a couple of your semin or a couple of your online seminars, which are great. And, but I never heard the whole, just the food breakdown. Like you're giving me an idea tonight. Can I start this with an older dog? Very much so. So I call it, um, re so, you know, when you have a computer and it's broken yeah. and you take it back to Apple and yeah. you say, to them, can you reboot my, my computer? Mm -hmm. Come back in an hour, Mr. Randall. I go and have a coffee, I come back, I've got a blank screen, it's all set up. All I've got to do now is not put any viruses on it because right. I've, I've had all the viruses on it. So now it's, it's rebooted. So I have dogs come in for a one month reset. Wow. So they come in for one month for four weeks and I reset their minds completely. And I do that around feed times. I reteach them life's commands. I reteach them to sit, verbal, the sit whistle. I reteach them the heel work on and off the lead, um, the hunt whistle, the recall whistle, the leave command. And I do that around every single meal time. And sometimes it might take me 10 minutes to feed a dog in the morning. But that, that 10 minutes I'm using, that 100, 200 grams, to teach that dog all those commands in a positive, rewarding way. Wow. So by the end of that month, the, the client has got multiple videos every week of that dog performing things. Um and then I go out, I, I still find it amazing, if I'm honest, it still shocks me. I do this, I, in fact, I'll give, you a, I'll give you an example. About 10 years ago, it was roughly 10 years ago, my mother and father, I built them a house and they moved in on the, uh, on the grounds with us to help us run the business and things. And I had this very important client's dog, quite a big shooting man, and it was a, a cocker spaniel and my dad said to me ben you've had that dog two weeks and i've not seen you take it out of the kennel of the yard bearing in mind my kennel is a big kennel with a big run and there's loads of training so it's not a kennel like you're thinking um he said that guy's charged you a lot of money you can't charge him ben you've been really lazy you haven't been training it i said okay dad yeah okay i, I, bet, I better start training it then so about a week went and it was three weeks now. And the guy was turning up in like four or five days. So I said to my dad, do me some, do me a favor. Can you stand on the bridge and video me in a paddock with this dog? Well, you haven't done it with it. So I brought the dog out. 
he basically, bearing in mind, my father saw the dog when it was dropped off and it ran off in the paddock and it took us 20 minutes to get it back. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I, and I videoed that. So I went out in the paddock and I walked it to heel on the lead, to heel off the lead, asked it to sit, recalled it, chucked a retrieve, sent it, stopped it, called it away from it, made it hunt an area, courted it, did everything with it that a cocker spaniel should do. Beautiful delivery, hill work, steadiness, everything. My father said, how, what, how have you done this? I said, dad, I fed it three times a day. I broke every th- every single mealtime feed down into multiples. I taught it in a rewarding, rewarding way to learn life's commands, to sit, to stay, to lead, the recall. I bomb-proofed it. I then did all that training at nights in the kennels at past 10 when I let them out for the last week. It was getting to sit when my dogs were eating, my dogs were retrieving things. I taught it in a in a pack to behave and to, to trust that if it sits there patiently, rewards will come. And then I took it into my yard where he couldn't see me in my yard because it's fenced in. And I was training the dog in the yard and I was getting really good results. And then I tried it in the paddock. And then when the client arrived, he stood on the bridge with my father and watched from the paddock and he couldn't believe his eyes. And that was about probably 10 or so years ago. And ever since I've developed and developed it every month, I get better at it. I'm not saying I'm complete. I've been doing this for 30 odd years, but I'm getting better every week. And I'm training more puppies myself. I've now also got puppy trainers working for me. So I, I've got, at the moment, I've got two cockers out being trained, um, two springers, and they're being trained using these methods. And every week I get sent multiple videos from my puppy trainers. And I've, I'm developing the trainers themselves. And that's part of the agreement. I develop them as trainers. And whilst I'm developing them as trainers, they're learning, getting better. And my dogs are getting better. And they they all say to me, I, I can't believe how much this dog can do at four or five months old. It's insane. But the dog isn't suppressed in any way. The dog's doing it with great fire in its belly, wagging its tail, loving it. But remember, we're not giving the dogs too much. We're just literally harnessing that that wild instinct they've got in them. They've, they, but, they've already got it genetically. It's in there. Of course they have. Of course they have, yeah. And, yeah. I mean, yeah. There, that would be the only outlier that you, let's say, some some line of dogs that was never hunted. If it's if it's not in there, it's not in there. But no, would would you Usain Bolt be world record Olympic champion if no one taught him the sprinting technique? No, right. No, he had to take nutrition. He had to weight train. He had to learn the sprinting technique. But my God, did he have natural ability. Mm-hmm. And all we did was harness that natural ability and get him so he understood his body, understood what power he had. Right. But he understood how to harness it. And we never let him go wrong. We never let him drink alcohol, drugs. We never let our, our dogs chase things and sow seeds that they shouldn't be sowing. Right. I always say that if my dog has chased a flapping pigeon multiple times, it will always in its mind want to do it again. Sure. And then you're all, that's always in there. It's always, it's always in, there. in there. It never get it out of the dog. It will always like, want it one day. And so it'll how, always let you go. And I know we, we, this would probably take hours, but would it be safe to say that with all this, the, the, the food conditioning, training, moving the food and, and your, your methods, how old would a dog be before it did see a bird? Like, I mean, um, every I dog, like, yeah. not every dog, every dog is different. different. Yeah. Every dog is different, isn't it? Every dog has got, every dog is like a human. Every dog is natural. Some are better than the others. Some are in, in academics, some are more gifted than others. And it's that, and in sport, some are more gifted than others. So every dog is completely different. There's a very hard one to give. But like this morning, for instance, both those litter sister and brother are seven months old and they had hundreds of birds sent in front of them and they put their head down, they started to hunt and I picked the whistle and they turned. I picked it and they turned and they stayed with me and they found and got success with balls around me and I put them away. I was so excited. I could have kept them out, but I put them away because I knew if they started finding birds then I was going to start, the whistle would ease off a bit and they wouldn't probably sit and turn as much. So right. I, I gave them a bit of exposure 
And now I know I've got to go back and, and reproof and reproof and reproof. So what I like to do, we start shooting properly in September. So September, October, November, December, January, five months of solid shooting every day, bar Sundays. So what I like to do with my youngsters, I like to take them to the shoot with me. And in the UK, we have four or five drives, and that's that's when we flush the birds out and we have four or five opportunities. And I normally am allowed to drive with my truck to each drive. And I get two or three dogs out, pick all the birds, put the birds in the game cart, put the dogs back in the truck, drive to the next drive, get a couple more dogs out. And I always end up, when I finish, there's always about 20 minutes time before the next drive, I get my youngsters out make them sit, meet other people, meet other dogs, let them have a wee, chuck them back in the truck. So they, they're getting used to their environment, but every time they get to that place, they come out, something good happens, but in a positive way, and they're controlled and they're relaxed and they're calm. I'm not getting them out and throwing a pigeon and letting them chase it. So then when they're in the car, they're relaxed because they know when they come out, they're just going to get a tidbit, a bit of loving, a toilet, a bit of hill work, meet a few other people. They're not in the back of the truck with the truck bouncing left and right because they can't wait to get out because they know someone's going to throw a live pigeon. Right. But it's right. also in the UK, we're not allowed to throw live pigeons. Oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. So if, if someone caught you doing that in the UK, you'd be strung up. Um, <laughs> so you're not allowed to do it anyway. So um, hence, we don't do it. Um, obviously, you know, in, in America, it's different. You're allowed to do those things. Um, and and that's that's the law. You can do it, so that's fine. Yeah. Um, is it right? Is it wrong? I, I, I've not really got an opinion on pigeons, but obviously pheasants and that I have um, because I respect them very much because those pheasants have created my career for me and helped me win trials. So, you know, and help my business by allowing me to shoot those birds so that i do hold them in a high regard um but in the uk we can't do it so that's 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 yeah. life well so i so if people get a picture of this you've got all different age dogs when you're doing when you're doing picking up when you're picking up birds yeah, but yeah. the young ones still aren't participating but they're kind of like going to the game but they're still not ready for prime time yet but they're just yeah. getting used to the so that it, it I mean, the trainer that we built the Upland Institute with, he uses the term impulse control, You're right? Because kids and dogs aren't born with impulse control. Given to their own devices, they'll act like crazy people if we yeah. didn't have that impulse control. Yeah, so yeah. It sounds like this is just a, like in the course of this dog's rearing from when it leaves its mom to when it sees its first bird, it has just learned a lot of control over its own impulses of course as yeah and, and it's learned almost like me to harness its own power right and i had a dog um two years ago that every time i bought it off someone late on and it had, had too many birds and i rang the guy and said to him you know i bought this cocker off you and i, I absolutely love it it's phenomenal and I, every time I cast it off, I get goose pimples on the back of my neck. Well, I cannot believe what I'm standing behind. But I need to ask you an honest question because you never told me when I bought it off you. Mm -hmm. How many birds did it chase? Oh, didn't didn't I tell you? It chases every day in the in the pen. I've got live pheasants in the pen. I let it chase and chase and chase, and it loses them, and it chases and chases them. I said, you never told me that. So I can't get it. I can't stop it from chasing at the moment. Every time it flushes a bird, it goes two bounces, and then it's gone. Right. And I shoot it, chase it. So I shot that dog nearly 50 pheasants off its nose. And all 50 pheasants out of 50, I probably picked up 40 plus of them myself. So what happened is the dog would flush it, bounce four or five feet. Now, most trainers would then put the collar on it or grab the dog and tell it off. Right. And sit it back where the original flush was. But I decided to do something different with this dog because I knew that it, it, it was pointless doing it the other way. So it bounced five or six feet. I shot the bird. I calmly walked past the dog, picked the bird up, walked back to the dog, showed the dog, said leave, put it in my pocket, 
walked the dog back, made it sit. Cast dog off, flushed it again. Dog bounced, shot it, picked it myself, put the dog back, sit. Showed it the bird, said leave. It knows leave, it knows sit. After about four or five flushes, the dog went flush, bang, sit. Like a, um, like a cobra, snake, bang, sat. I shot it. I waited five, six seconds. Amy, get out. Straight out, straight back. She got a reward. Right. Every, every bird from then on, she sat beautifully. Okay. And you just had to hit I, that reset, but you had to bring it yeah. to the computer shop. You had to reset. I did, but, I did, but then this is a little thing went wrong. So I went to a trial and I won with her. But when I was in that trial, I had three contact flushes and I sent her for all three birds. Where in training, I would have only, even if she sat hmm. beautifully, I'd still probably pick one up. Right. I sent her for all three. Then I was really busy for three days or four days after. So I could only train her off game. <clears throat> and then I went to another trial and I cast her off. She flushed a bird and sat. They shot it and they clipped it and it went 80 yards. And the gamekeeper said, leave it. Don't want it. We get someone else to pick it. And my dog went, dad, I can definitely get this for you. Right. And it was gone. And and I ended up letting my very good friend have her, and he loves her. <laughs> but there's an example of a dog that had so much go wrong with her early doors. Right. I shot 50 birds for it at £25 a bird. Cost me a fortune. I yeah. won a trial with it. But because I gave it three birds in that trial, it thought it could do what it wanted again. Right. He said, oh, everything's back to the way I used to do it. Yeah. Right. They're, so all my, I, they're all my birds. Yeah. Yeah. And when I, well, I remember casting it off under the judge and he said to me, oh, my God. He actually commented, oh, my God. And I knew if it sat to flush, you couldn't beat it. It was just phenomenal. Right. It, didn't, it went. So I know that was his fault. He sown a seed early on. The dog's never, ever forgotten that seed. And it always wanted it back. That's why when I have a little puppy, I never throw a ball for it and let it chase it. Even I, as a puppy, eight, ten weeks old, I sit and I hold the puppy and I say sit and I roll the ball and the puppy sits. And when the puppy stops fidgeting, I point my hand, release my left hand and say, fetch, get out, whatever command you want to use. Dog goes out and gets it. So even from day one, I'm quite paranoid. I never let them chase anything. Of course, they get lots of retrieves, but they do it from me releasing them. So in their mind, from eight, ten weeks, I'm getting that ball I want from him. When I'm calm, he releases me. Right. So even from day one. And then by the time they get that ball, they're already beautifully steady on their food. Right. I've already simulated right. the perfect send. Yeah. So if you, for example, let's say you had a Labrador or a Spaniel, that every time you went down with your hand to point it, the dog went early or the dog didn't look down your arm enough. So a dog should look down your arm like a rifle. Right. And it should trust the direction you're giving it. And when you say um, duke back, duke fetch, whatever you say, the dog should look down your arm and just drive a line. 20 yards, 200 yards. So people say to me, every time I put my arm down, Ben, the dog goes early. Every time I put my arm down, it's looking everywhere but down my arm. I said, right, feed it every morning with multiple feeds and teach it to look down your arm at multiple distances at the bowl of food and do that for one week and then go out in the paddock and see if it works. And they all ring me and go, Oh my God, I just reset. <laughs> so every day they did it in the, in the pen, in the pen, in the garden. And they did it with the food. They went out in the paddock, pointed the hand, the dog looked down their arm. I know what you mean. I know exactly what you mean. You've just taught me multiple times this week that I look down your arm and I go on a trigger. When you pull the trigger, you say, duke back, I'm gone. So these little things make perfect sense. Yeah. Um, and in the UK, we use a hunt whistle. Um, we used to use high loss lots, but we use a hunt whistle to get a dog to hold an area really tightly. So if someone said to me, Ben, the bird is six foot to the left of that log. That's what the gun's telling me. Pick that bird. Now, when I'm judging UK, Europe, when I'm shooting and training, I see so many clients send their dogs to the area or competitors and they stop the dog and say high loss or high to low hunt whistle. The dog rakes around in a big area frantically and sometimes the scent is very poor. They cannot win the bird. 
The dog then gets called up by the judge. The judge walks forward, picks it up. The, di- the guy is out, eliminated. Right. So I see this lot. So my dogs are taught the hunt whistle with their food from a puppy. So let's say my dog gets its first bird when it's 12, 14 months old. So 12, 14 months old, my dog has never, ever heard the hunt whistle unless it's had its food or a ball or a dummy instantly at its feet. Right. So the dog has no reason to ever disbelieve that command I'm giving it because I've never lied to my dog ever. Right. The dog's heard the stop whistle, so it spins and stops instantly because the dog knows that we have a command coming now which is going to give me a reward. Right. So that's why I call it the BG positive stop because they want to stop because the next command is coming. So all that is basically imprinted in their mindsets from a puppy over the first six or so months until they put all that into practice out in the field on dummies and balls. I, it sounds so simple. It is. If I can do it. It's, <laughs> it's just, it sounds like everybody in the world has to feed their puppy. And I mean, this, and obviously this goes to house dogs, right? I mean, what yeah, we have a, we have a new app being launched next month, which is called the Dog App, and it's a pet app, and it's the same methods as my Gun Dog Prover methods, right? And it's going to be a game changer in a world of dogs. We hope there's I mean, a hundred million dogs in the world. Yeah, and I can't imagine. I I don't I don't know. I've never had a puppy that wasn't food motivated. You know, they from the first day they get their mash, they look like they haven't eaten in their whole life. Right? They're Exactly. That is when it when it's time to eat, you can count on a puppy, you know, devouring its food. So I, I yeah, that whole boy, there it's gonna take a little longer to feed some. I'm I've only got two that I'm gonna try it with right now, but um going back to throwing the uh the tennis ball or the dump, you know, down while you're holding the puppy. <clears throat> My first cocker that unfortunately died very early. Um, I was just so enamored with this little girl. I would sit at my table right where I'm at and I would throw a tennis ball with no, you know, no holding her back. Right. And it was like, it was like playing handball with her and she absolutely, of course she loved it. She just loved it. And she was good at bringing it back, but I brought her up to Jordan up in Wisconsin to try to do a little work with her. And he called me up. He says, how much did you play with the tennis ball with her? I said, a lot. (laughs) He goes, how much is a lot? I said, every day. He goes, did you ever make her wait? I said, no. He goes, I don't know if I can fix this dog. <laughs> I mean, I yeah. expounded that problem. And it was like like a human thing. Like, well, she loves doing it. Yeah. She could have loved it just as much if I would have done that little simple, you know, hold her back while she was little. And, and, and what she would have got from that is... Obviously, she'd have been calmer, calmer, more patient. But one thing she'd have got from it, which is really important, she'd have got a mutual trust with you. Right. She had to have trusted you to sit. Right. And if she trusts you, she gets it. Right. So I find that my bond and my trust build so much quicker with my puppies. Right. Because they know that I'm throwing it for them. So if they trust me and they do as they're told, the reward's coming. Right. I start to build that bond and that trust from day one. Yeah. And and it also how easy your dog was your dog could retrieve it easily because it was in the in the mindset. It was there. It was already picked it. Right. So it's so why practice stupid easy things. <laughs> Let's make it a bit harder. Let's throw it and let the dog wait for 10 seconds. Right. Let's, right. So I, I I love to teach memory retrieves. So you will see me with a little puppy. And I'll put the bowl of food on the floor at 12 o'clock. And I'll let the puppy put his head in the bowl. And I'll lift the puppy out and put it up to my stomach. And I'll walk backwards at 6 o'clock. And the whole time the puppy's looking at the bowl of food. Mm-hmm. And I'll walk way back at 6 o'clock, get on my knees at 6 o'clock, ask the dog to sit and hold it in between my knees, point my hand and say, get out. Dog goes out, gets the food, eats the food. Then I go... Dog recalls back to me, hold it, sit. Good girl. So now I've taught it to remember something I've dropped and not forget it because a puppy has got a really short attention span. So many years ago, 
when my son was um a baby he's 19 now so it was nearly nearly 20 years ago i said to him i was watching the rugby and i said to him go and ask your mother for a beer so he plods out the kit out the lounge 20 minutes later i've got no beer so i said to my wife did joe ask you for a beer no never said a word so he'd forgot from the from the bloody lounge to the lounge door he'd forgotten i wanted a beer right and that's what, that's what puppies are like so i thought to myself how can I develop these puppies' minds better? So right. what I start doing is what I've explained to you is a memory tree with their food. So when I can go from 12 o'clock to 6 o'clock and wait 10 seconds and send them, that's great. Then I turn my back on the food and walk with them so they can't see the food. Then I turn around at 6 o'clock and send them. Then I walk out the room with the dog. Then I walk around the kitchen table five times. Then I put it on the floor and I say, get out. And he's got to remember to go under the table, round the table, through the lounge, through that door, pick it. And then I put it in the lounge and I go through four or five rooms and go out into the garden and send it back into the house. He's got to remember where the food is. So already I'm starting to get that young puppy to mature a bit quicker. Develop, a bit more develop quicker. its memory. Develop its memory. Develop its memory. So I my, my psychology viewpoint is that if I can get them to develop their memory that and retain that, the the retain where I put the food and remember it, surely they can retain my my commands for longer and get them quicker. Right. Because if you've got a dog like your cocker, was in the moment, throw, bang, pick, throw, bang, pick, every time, he doesn't have to think because it's right in front of him. Yeah. But I'm making my dogs think and remember and to focus and to trust me and build a bond that they're going to get it off me. Right. So that's why at six, eight months old, my dogs are like two-year-old dogs. And that is why when they get to seven to 10 years old, they're still trained and they still listen and they don't need reprimanding. Right. Because they're still trained throughout that whole that career because I've built an incredible trust. And I think that because I then retire most of my dogs to trainers or pet homes, if they can maintain them and they're not me, it means that it's worked even more, doesn't it? Yeah. Oh, my They're God. They're not professional trainers. They're not professionals. They're just normal people. Right. You know, the when I, I, I know the pointing dog and the flushing dog, certainly they're different, but they're both dogs, and they learn the same way. And yeah. one of the things that Justin does early on, he does what he calls a calming touch. He stacks the dog up almost like it was in a confirmation show, even when it's a real small puppy. And gets that dog used to stroking the legs, stroking the back, stroking the head, you know, all that where the, you know, in the, fir <clears throat> the first time he does it, he's actually got the dog tethered off because the dog's naturally going to want to, you know, yeah. fidget. And <clears throat> along all his training, as that dog gets older, before he ever sends it, or even when it comes back, before he ever takes anything or sends it for anything, that same hand that dog's learned like, oh, his hands just mean something's coming. Yeah. And he could do, he could stroke that dog for 10 minutes and it would retrieve just as good as it did with the person who just let it go. And it's just amazing. Like when you get ready to send a dog in, in our, like when I've judged the pointing dog uh, tests, the people who rely on just that bang go, right? They literally... Yeah. <clears throat> They literally can't walk up to the dog and because the minute they put their hand on the dog or give it the signal, the dog's always kind of jumping the gun. But the so, good so, trainers... so imagine, imagine with that pointing, imagine you had um you taught it to stand for its food like that. Right. And you put it on a grooming table and right. you tipped up. There's nothing wrong with using a table, I don't think, because you groom dogs. Every pet in the world is bloody groomed. Right. So you put it on a grooming table, you put the food down, or you put a dummy down or a bird down on the table, a dead one, and the dog looks at it and you teach it to stand in that environment. Then you get the dog off the table, then you put the bird, bird on the floor and hide it so they know where it is, and it's a scent. Right. And you get them to stand there. And I don't actually, with my HPRs I train, I don't touch them because I just want them to stand, because I, I don't want to touch them because I want to shoot the bird. So okay. when we've got our HPRs quartering, they come onto a, a bird and they stop and they point. We then go over closer, get in the position. 
we give the, I normally give the hunt whistle, they go in, flush and stop, shoot, break the guns, send the Labrador. Yeah. And the Labrador runs past and picks it. Now, obviously, occasionally, if you haven't got any Labradors, the pointer gets it. Sure. Um, but I see, I see so many HPR trainers in the UK and US, the dogs are quartering beautifully. They go on an amazing point and it's like, wow, stunning to watch. I absolutely, I admire it hugely. But when they flush it, the dog runs in and right. chases the bird. I'm like, for, excuse my French, yeah. why, surely it would be lovely to get your dog to flush it and wait and you shoot it and it stays on the mark and it fixates on the mark. You break your gun. It's safe. Right. Send the dog. Yeah. But it gets them. What happens, you know, what happens if two birds get up when that bird is shot? Right. Your dog's <clears> chasing <throat> everywhere. So I just prefer to have that control with them. And I think with all my HPR breeds over here, which I don't specialize in them, but I train them just like a Labrador. And then I do the hunting like a Spaniel, but at vast distances, obviously. Um, but the flush is very similar. The hill works the same. The sit's the same. The recall's the same. The left and right directions are the same. Sure. Um, the leave command's the same. Um, and everything we do in terms of retrieving is the same. They've got four right. legs and a tail. If a bird is shot at 20 or 100 yards, you're expected to pick it. Right. You know, Very when, you, when you mentioned the, the hunt point retrieve, HPR, uh, uh, a dog breeder and trainer and competitor from Hungary, her name is Zofi. Um, I can't ever get her last name right. She came over to the States, and I've got a young wire-haired Vigila that's through her breedings here. And she came over to run in our versatile dog test and she thought it was kind of uh, whether it was humorous or silly just the same point you made her pointing dogs not only point but they flush and sit yes so, so and we train we think we're doing really good if we can go kick the bird up and chase the bird and throw a hat at the bird you know, because we don't want to it's like we don't trust this dog to stand there any longer, right? Yeah. And she had to come here. And because in our test format, it's not that she wouldn't be allowed. It's It just isn't in our format. She only had like, I think, 10 days to get her. She had to kind of reset her dog, say, hey, listen, while we're in America, it's going to be okay to act like a little heathen <laughs> and go go get the bird. But then I said, if you told our dog trainers you had to add that level in, I swear it would it would it would mess their world up. If they, they, they probably put they they put a collar on the neck and a collar on the ass and I, a collar yeah. on both legs. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, and we're getting it. We're getting those dogs to points when there's large covers of grouse. Right. Or there's, there's hares or there's 50, 60 partridges. And we're doing it naturally. Right. Building it up, you see, each day. I just think, I, I know that I've got some very, very respectful trainers in America that I know well, and they've won multiple championships. They're hugely respected. I could learn a huge amount from them, and I respect them very much. Um, but I just feel morally in my in my heart that I don't feel like I need to do that to an animal or a human when I can do it another way that works. Right. So it's just, you know, it's just my opinion. And I, I wasn't going to come on here tonight and say, you shouldn't use them. I'm just saying that there's definitely an alternative. Yeah. And the, the way, the alternative that we are using far exceeds the temptation your dog's under compared with ours. Yeah. And, and if, if you start it early, it, it just, it just makes sense. <clears throat> you know, you, you go back to the children analogy. You you know, the children that had a solid foundation from their parents when they go to school and you check the report cards and you know, the ones that they were just let, they were just let wild, basically, you know, they were almost feral. Exactly. And, and, and if you could have taken those children as newborn babies and switched parents, you'd have the same thing again, right? The child would learn no impulse control and the child that was raised properly would 
in one in one multi universe it would have been the the criminal and another multi universe it would have been you know the college graduate doctor professor but we get that all the time and when um christian forsberg is my my partner with the gundagap and the story behind him he he went to multiple trainers read every book you could think of and his dog was going out on a retrieve his cocker spaniel he was calling it clapping its hands dog wouldn't come back to him he said i just felt like an idiot then i, I couldn't get a dog then i went to a couple of trainers which were quite hard on my dog and i got in the car and thought you know my dream was to leave london move to the countryside and get a dog mm-hmm. to be my companion i don't really want to whack it i don't really want to tell it off all the time i want to enjoy it and then he found me and I said, look, this is what I do it differently. I'm not saying it's the best way. I'm not saying it's the only way, but I do it differently. Come and right. learn with me. And he learned with me. And then he said to me, I'm a tech guy. I want to set this up with you because I want everyone to have what I've witnessed for the last six months with you. Because right. I sat on all that then. And now I've got a dog which is pretty well trained. I've had my first shooting season with him, but he could be could have been so much better if I hadn't missed that 12 months. Right, right. He said, this is the app that I wanted. I wish I'd have had when I started with my dog. And that's why he asked me whether I would be interested in developing my training techniques on video for everyone to see. Right. And I was cautious at the start. Do I want to show everyone my techniques? But I've got a lady, I've got a lady at the moment in New Zealand that has won three retriever tests with a dog that was biting birds not bringing them back to her, running off with them. Absolutely diabolical. This dog's won twice. She's got a young puppy, which is now beating multiple dogs, very experienced dogs. This puppy's beating them all in in tests on live birds. And we've had multiple emails. She's even come on live webinar. You may have seen her when you're on there. Um, And I'm getting regular updates that she's winning with this dog. Wow. You know, I have another young lady that's... um, is on my Instagram and she's called Seven Crest Gun Dogs. And she's got a young puppy called Harris, who's Harris is probably 17 weeks, one of my lab pups. Um, mm-hmm. And what that dog can do is insane. So people can follow that um, and watch what she's doing. And she trained her retriever for 14 months using the app. And she's won three retriever tests with it already this season by 14 months. And she's a complete novice handler. That's, so it just it just proves that it works. Right, right. It <clears throat> it I I I hope I hope this takes over. I, I mean, and I think it will. I think I've I've tried to make the point on my podcast about going slow, but it's not just about going slow. I, I'm just trying to get people to slow down and they don't need a bunch of birds shot over them when they're little bitty puppies. But I've never got that message across to people of that building that that food that trust that bond and i think that i would say i i go back in my head right now thinking about a dog that i always felt that i always felt was very uncooperative right but i didn't do any of that that's kind of from that period when i went from you know no collar to a collar and 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 I'm like, I wonder how good that dog could have been because his his retrieving and his dead work was phenomenal. That was all natural. And his cooperation, I always said it was just his, he was low on cooperation. But now in hindsight, I was like, well, he was really low on me doing anything right with him when he was a puppy. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, the argument I probably get the most from my US clients is that, um, and it's not arguments because we don't argue about it because I never... I never push my opinion on them. I just give them a, my experiences. And I say to them, you know, if you want to use a place board and you get great success from it, use it. But do you use it? No, I don't. But I've developed a similar system without a board. Right. So that's how I do it. So I think is that for me, psychology wise, that's the best way to be. And then they say to me, um, but Ben, what you don't understand is that our dogs are so highly bred and wired We've got to use a collar to control them. And then I say to them, okay, well, let me see you train some of these young dogs. Can you show me some videos? 
Right. So there's one girl that's winning quite a lot at the moment in America. She's doing really well and she uses lots of my commands. She's had the app. She trains both ways, mine and US way. And she's had quite a lot of success by the looks of it. But then I've seen, an, I had another person that was training their dog and they said to me, they're going to have to put a color on it, condition it because it's getting really wired. And I was watching them train this dog and they were taking it out on the lead. It was pulling on the lead and jerking. They had a pigeon, wing clipped, throw it on the floor. The pigeon would fly 20 yards, hit the floor and run. They take the lead off, dog go down, take a line on it, drive in, smash and grab it and bring it back to them. And they did that for like a week constantly. And then they took the pigeon and did it. And the dog went out there and flushed it, jumped in the air, six foot, tried to bite it, missed it. Dog hit the floor, chased it. And they said, now you see why we need a collar, Ben. You see why we need one? Because the dog's wired. I right. said, no, you need a collar because you have no idea what you are doing. <laughs> they, were, they weren't very impressed with that. But when I explained to them how I would do it, they started to understand that actually what they're doing is just teaching all the wrong behaviours early doors. Right. They teach them way too early. There's no need to do this yet. Let's get the control and everything first. So let's flick the bird on the floor. Let the dog watch it walk away. Let it go into some cover so it can't find it. Then ask it to hunt it and let it grab it and bring it back if you want. But if the dog can't sit there steady and go on your command, then don't do it. Right. It's not ready. And it's not ready mentally to do it. And then the, what they do then is they start to... So I see so many people at, in the US when I was there, they had these amazing dog crates all these dogs lined up, all the crate doors are open. There's like six lines of heads sticking out of the dog. And then as the heads are sticking out, they're putting collars on them all. <laughs> and then they get them out one at a time. They flush a bird, they jab it. The dog sits beautifully, shot, bang, 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 bang. They train every day, twice a day, ready for the trial on Saturday, for example. They then get the dog out of the car and they don't put the collar on. They then go to the trial Pass the dog off. It doesn't turn every time on the whistle, but it doesn't get a jab. And then it flushes a bird and moves a bit, and it doesn't get a jab. And it picks a bird and comes back. And then in the second series, it moves a bit more, and it doesn't turn because it's getting a jab. And the third series, it gets put out. Yeah. So because... The dog has become, tri become trial and collar aware very, very quickly. Yeah. So yeah. about... 25 years ago, when I was playing rugby semi-professionally, we had a, a psychologist come in and we thought, who on earth is this bloke? We play rugby to drink and meet girls. This, this sounds like game. Ted Lasso. This <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is the game of rugby. This is what we do it for. And this guy wrote all these things on the wall. And back back then, I had a nice head of hair. So I used to make myself look quite pretty before I went out. So I used to look in the mirror a lot. And he knew that. So he wrote this thing on the mirror and it said, and I still use it every day for the last 25 years, train how you play, play how you train. So example, there's no point in passing the ball forwards all week and not tackling when on Saturday the coach says, everyone must pass it backwards and you must tackle but we haven't practiced that all week. So by going out with a dog with a collar on or going out with a dog and punishing it during training is completely different than what you're going to do in the competition. Right, right. So you're, you're practicing two different things. So I see people do it. Here's two examples. They're without, this is examples of the outer collar, but imagine the collar is the same as what I'm going to give. The dog's hunting and it doesn't turn on the whistle. They go, one pip or two pips, dog doesn't turn. They go, ah, ah. the dog turns, quarters it, dog doesn't turn, ah, 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 ah. the dog turns. Now, they go to a competition a week later and they go, the dog goes, well, you've taught me to turn with a, ah, 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 ah. Right, I right. and, the, and I'm judging them thinking, and I say to them, I bet you'd love to go, ah, 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 wouldn't you? And they go, <laughs> hey, he'd turn every time, Ben, if I said that. I go, oh, okay. I thought, have you not worked it out yet? You've taught your dog to turn with a pip and a ah, ah. Right, right. They, then they blow the stop whistle at 50 yards. They go, dog doesn't stop. And they go, ah, sit, sit. 
the dog sits. And they do that multiple times a week, preparing the dog all the way for Saturday's field trial, get to the field trial, blow the whistle, the dog goes, oh, you haven't shouting at me yet, I don't need to stop. Yeah, what happened to the ah, 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 ah. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's common, it's common sense. Right. So what, yeah, so the dog that's trained by the collar only is like, where's the collar? Exactly the same. That, exactly. And I've seen it so many times when people, you know, miss a few things in a test and they absolutely said, you know, this dog is an angel when it's on the collar. <laughs> it's not it's not an angel when it's on the collar dog yeah. smart enough to know that like okay the, yeah. the collar's on and i don't want to get shocked but it hasn't really learned anything no it's, all it, it's, what it realizes is that when the collar's on as i'm told when it's off i do what i want right right so I, it's like me saying um i can walk my spaniel on the lead through that pheasant pen with a thousand birds and it doesn't chase one of them Mm -hmm. it's on the bloody lead so then in the competition I've got to walk my dog to hill through the pen but I've never practiced that because yeah. I've done it on the lead of course I've got to condition the dog on the lead to do it perfectly Sure. and I've got to condition it to do it off the lead and when I so I'm very much in the mindset of practicing everything I'm going to do at the trial and trying to simulate the trial as close as possible and I ran for seven years field trial training days and they become very popular in the UK. Um, and they're, they've been run, I started to run them about, what was it now? It'd been about 10 years ago I started, um, maybe 11 years ago. And I've stopped doing it now because just time. But I ran field trial training days. So we simulated the trial as closely as we could, allowed, allowed handlers to fix their dogs if they went wrong in a, rewarding way not a physical way um the dogs learned that they were coming to an environment um twice a week with ben with, with 20 other people they were going wrong but being put right and they were learning how to do it in this environment they went to a trial they're all oh, at the same place we've got to do as we're told here right and they started winning, started winning and i made up i think that in that little period oh i think i made i won with three cocker three cocker winners I won a open winning with a dog. I won a made a champion spring up. I made a champion cock up, and I won the championships back to back. Wow! Because I simulated everything I could with those dogs, and simulated as close as I could to the championships, as close as I could to a field trial. Ben, do you take um, when you're in the in the midst of doing this? Like you, you mentioned a paddock for anybody who doesn't know what a I know what a paddock is. What I call a horse paddock. I yeah. don't know how I don't know how big of this enclosure you're talking about, but will you also go to different paddocks because yeah, so one, you want to go to different places that the dog has to understand that oh, it's not just our paddock. It's I agree, I agree, and that's one thing at the moment because I'm so busy. I probably don't do enough of, if I'm honest. But every time I go to these new places, it just takes the dogs a little bit of time to come out of themselves right. and. But when they get to that new place, they may be in, if fifth gear was the fastest, they may be in third or fourth gear, and then they get to fifth occasionally, which right. is perfect match for me. But my paddocks are, say, an acre to half yeah. an acre. Mm -hmm. Right, so uh, this is quite a funny one. So um, I kept showing the breeder of Holly Betch Fatty, Gareth Davis, good friend of mine. I kept showing him videos of Fatty. And he kept saying to me, I had like a, a rugby pitch and a paddock. And he said to me, um, Ben, stop showing me a picture of this dog. You you can win the championships in that paddock. And I'm sure you can win the championships in that rugby pitch. I said, listen, if I can't win the championships in that paddock and I can't win it on a rugby pitch, I'm not going to win it at the championships. <laughs> he laughed at me. He laughed at me. Anyway, I won the championships. <laughs> so I said to him, it's a good job I practice in that paddock, isn't it? And I got them perfect in the paddock first. And he said, Ben, he said, it's, I've not heard a truer word. He said, you're dead right. You've got to get perfection in the environment that, that you train in. And then you've got to test it in different environments. Right. If it's not, if I took my dog in my paddock every day and in a 20 minute session, it misbehaved multiple times, 
and went wrong multiple times, how on earth do I expect to compete with it? That would be like saying, well, you know what? Maybe it's the paddock's fault. I'll go use the other paddock. <laughs> that's just, that's the yeah, definition exactly. of insanity, exactly. right? Yeah. And the paddock's boring because it go, we go in there every day. But my paddocks have got wild birds in, they've got rabbits in, they've got multiple trees planted, jumps. So they, my dogs love it in that paddock. But before I put my dogs on game, which is tomorrow in theory, um, the dogs have been performing absolutely pinpoint in my paddocks. Right. I couldn't ask for any more. They've been perfect. Right. So I know that they're ready now to test that in different environments. Of course, they've been out a few times and I've tested them a little bit and dogging in and things. Right. Uh, and they flush birds. But when I got to dogging in with my experienced dogs, they were they were almost perfect, but lacked a gear of drive. And the more I shoot for them, the more the gear will lift and they right. get fast, slower. So do I want a dog? If fifth gear was your fastest gear, do I want a dog doing fifth gear in my paddock all the time, constantly on dummies? If that's happening on dummies, it's going to go into fifth gear and overdrive on birds. Right. It's going to burn out so its transmission. Yeah. <laughs> so I just literally want them a little bit low, lower key on dummies in, in an era that they know. Right. And then when I take them on the live stuff, they stay in that gear third or fourth. And the more they get shot, the more success they get, the higher their gears lift. But they but still have all that retention. They, they still have the control right. and the trust and they understand and they the, the partnership. We're working together all the time. It's all about follow me over here. I'm going to come. So I move around a lot in the UK. We've got like vast woodlands with bramble and bits and there's birds everywhere. But we can see the birds and we can see where they potentially would go. So a dog would hunt a leaf bottom, and but you and I, Ron, know there's nothing in that leaf bottom. Right. But we need some bramble patches to the right or left, so we move that way with the dog. And when the dog listens to me and moves that way, and I point at the bramble bush and it gets success when it goes in, it believes me even more. Right. It trusts me even more. It doesn't have to go on the leaf bottom and get nothing. And then the dog gets naughty and pulls away from the leaf bottom and finds on its own accord. And then the dog thinks, that idiot was hunting me in the leaf bottom. I do not <laughs> need to listen to him as much as he thinks. I'm better than him, so I'm gonna go over here. And then you get a dog that becomes quite self-employed quickly. Self, I like that. We call them self-hunters. I, I guess self-employed is a, a better self term. Yeah, yeah. Um, and remember, when you've been self-employed for a long time like me, I could never work for anyone else. There you go. <laughs> I could be a nightmare, right? So when a dog becomes self-employed, it can never really want to work for anyone. Right. It, because it it's taught itself. This is, yeah. I get as much enjoyment out of this as anything. And, you know, something I also learned watching Justin develop these pointing dogs, how he breaks apart. And I've seen, again, so many people do this. They start trying to steady their dog shooting at a bird. Right. And he steadies his dogs first, like on a stop to flush. But in the beginning, it could be just taking his hat off his head and dropping the hat. And for a dog that's not trained, that dog would probably run and grab that hat. And he said, well, if I can't get my dog to not pay attention to the hat that fell off my head, how am I going to get him to not chase a bird? He's, you know, if the wind blows his hat off his head and the dog chases it. So he yeah. takes it. It very compartmentalizes. He doesn't bring it all together until all those parts are evident. Yeah, you can't. It's no, like it's having not a confusing to the dog. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You got to, to have a jigsaw puzzle. Make it complete. You need every piece. Right, right. You've got five pieces missing. It looks shit. <laughs> it does. It does. Um, it's never finished. Yeah. So is, I think. I think. I think that. I find a lot of my US clients now that use the app and my methods are very much buying into they're enjoying their dog more. They've got a better relationship with their dog. They know the relationship's going to last longer and they're going to have far more years hunting out of this dog right. because the dog's better. And I say to them, there's very few people in the world 
that have a full-term hunting career. So yep. most of us have to work, and there's 365 days in a year. Right. And most people in the UK get 20 days holiday. Right. Now, that 20 days, you've got to keep the wife happy. They've got to keep the kids happy. So they might go shooting 10 times. Yeah. That's, a, rea- got- that's a reality. That's a reality. Yeah. Everywhere in the world. So let's say you're super lucky and you go 20 times. Well, it's 365 days in a year. Your dog for 340 odd needs to do something else. Right. It needs to train and learn. And also, on top of that training and learning, you're working from eight till five. So you've got a small window in the morning to train it and a small window at night. And then you've got Saturday and Sundays if you're lucky. Right. Right. So you, you're limiting now. So the dog has to become part of that family. It doesn't want to be spinning around in a kennel and barking all day. It wants to be in the house with the kids and the family, but all the kids and the family buy into the training system. Right. And then you're going to enjoy that dog and get so much more pleasure from that dog because yeah. it's a family companion first and a shooting dog second. Yeah. Even my trial dogs, when Fatty won the championships the second year, she was nine, 80% in the home. And she, and, went out, she went out and made history. And, that, and that's by design, by you. Now... I, I would assume, like my dogs, my dogs are kind of, I would call them kennel dogs, except that I'm in this building where you're looking at me and I'm in here with them all day long. So yeah. I think they think this is my house, right? Because they're always around me, but they're walled off on kennels and then they get to have their free time and they go back in. And I've, I've always said it's a little easier, maybe with one dog, but when you've got multiple dogs, it's easier the way I do it because. I couldn't bring, how many dogs could you have in your house? You know, yeah, I agree. I agree with you. So I, I'm, I'm like, you know, I've got a big long, I call it the long room and it's a big shoot room, big yeah. gun cabinet and kitchen at the end, lovely table, mm. log burner, sofa, and a massive couple of dog beds. Right. And when I come from shooting, I might have five or six that come in with me by the log burner after yeah. I fed them and towel them off and they sit by the log burner when we're catching up on the rugby. <laughs> uh, we, have, we have a beer a chinese delivered um yeah. and then at the end of the day they go out and they go back in the kennel right so yeah. I'm, ch- I'm chatting to you now in the office yeah. um and it's raining heavily here so my dogs are soaking wet so they're in the kennels now drying off right right and with heat lamps on um so rather than being in here running around my feet when i'm trying to chat with you yeah. they're in there because i'm concentrated so uh, she she was a very special bitch and i I never had any expectations to win it twice because it hadn't been done for 50 years. For, well, 30 off five years then, it's now 50. So I, I had no expectations to win it again. But what I did know is that I owed her everything, that yeah. dog for winning that championships. And when I I was in a runoff with an open show and to beat him as well was even more special. Um, so because he is the best in the business, so almost successful. So I beat him. That made it even more special. I knew how good she was because I've judged the championships and won lots of trials. And I knew that on her day, if she gets birds and the guns kill them, then it's going to be a very, very hard dog to beat. Right. If not impossible. Now I got a, this is a, 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 like a total novice question. Let's say you've got, you've had this dog that you just knew she was something special. Right. But, would I be able to tell the difference with her in a paddock and you just doing some stuff and another dog her own age? Would I be able to see it? Or is this something, is, is there little something, what are you seeing that's was so special about that dog? I think that what's, what's so special about it is that I just specifically, we just grew a bond together. But since I won with her, and had that success with her, like 15, she, she, about, she, she died now, she's about 16 now. But I've trained multiple dogs since then, right. fully trained. I've had the same bond with them. Right. Because she was, the, she was the first dog as a puppy that I trained with this new system. Okay. So there's a couple of reasons why I did that. Um, everyone asked me why she's called Holly Betch Fatty. 
Yeah. <laughs> right. And her name is renowned over the world. Everyone knows her as Fatty, not Sophie, which is her kennel name. Mm -hmm. So the breeder is Welsh, unfortunately. <laughs> I, am I am English. Okay. okay. So I'm, we're gifted, obviously. And <laughs> I am English. So England and Wales hate each other when it comes to the rugby season. Okay. So we have quite a bit of banter with each other. So there was also another chap which was from up north in England, and he, they've got a similar reaction to the Southerners, they call them. So they thought as a joke, Ben's having this dog of you. Let's call it after your kennel name, Holly Betch Fatty, because he'll have to put his kennel club name on it. Right. Holly Betch Fatty of Beggarbush. <laughs> they wanted it to be Fatty Ben, basically, Fatty of Beggarbush. So I decided not to put my name on it. I wish I had it off. If I'm <laughs> but what I decided to do was train this dog completely differently than I've ever done before and use this new psychology approach I had because I'd only the year, not long before I'd had her, I'd had her half-sister, same mother, so same father, mm -hmm. the sister, the mothers were sisters. And I made her a champion, field trial champion, Chuiki Housen of Beggarbush. Very hard going, probably better than Fatty, but very hard to control. On the on the limit of going wrong every time I took her out because even, I gave even with, her. even with the same methods. Just no, it was a different, it was a different method. It was, oh, that was a different method. Okay, I gave her too much, but too many birds, too many rabbits. Okay, um, ran her in the championship, and she moved six foot. The judge sent me, and he said, "I said, what did you send me for?" He goes because I've never witnessed anything like it in my life, Ben. It was phenomenal. I just wanted to see it retrieve, but you're <laughs> out. I said, okay. Yeah. Um, I would have put myself out earlier. But anyway, um, she was a phenomenal bitch. And because this bitch was the same way bred, basically, I was worried about it. And I was petrified it was going to be like this one, even though I made it a champion. Right. So I trained her with the psychology approach I wanted. And I got a lot of stick for it. I got a lot of people like joking with me, oh, here's a psychologist coming and, you know, why have you done this? You've been training dogs since you were a kid and that's not how you do it. And I stuck my head above the parapet slightly and I got a bit of stick for it. But when I started having the success with her, it was there to see. So I had the success with her and then I made up another champion Springer and then I made up another champion Springer and then I made up an open winning Springer and then I won with multiple other springers and cockers using the same method. And on top of that, I had two children. I'm running a business and I bought a new kennels. So I was trying to do all this around my life, family life. But one thing I had time to do was feed my dogs. Feed your dogs. Whilst I, whilst I fed them, no matter how busy I was, I could teach them certain things every day, twice, three times a day. That is, I am sure you are going to make some head spin and obviously some interest in the, in the gun dog app. Yeah. Um, give, I, I've got a couple more questions, but I don't want to, sometimes I'll say, Oh, Ben, it was great talking to you. How do people, what's the best way for people to participate and, and, and get involved with, and I'm, I'm saying it's a gun dog app, the beggar bush. And I don't yeah. want to say that. So if you, yeah, if you go onto the app store and just type in Gundog app, the Gundog. app comes up. Gundog, Gundog app. app. And you just click onto the app and you pay for a year or subscribe to it. Right. And on, to on top of that, we've now added in a webinar. So a normal webinar, we researched it between 40 to 60 pounds a month, every webinar. But we've included that in the price now for $24.99. So it's, it's peanuts. And I've yeah, done this. So I want it for... 60p a day, 80p pence a day, you've got 300 videos of my techniques that work and right. are proven with multiple champions and thousands of people every day using it. On top of that, you've got a fully live interactive webinar where I help you. And right. Talk to you. And I can attest, I've attended a couple of them. They're very, they're very engaging. Um, yeah. And I learn all the time. I, I think that because I train pet dogs as well, I think that's helped me with my gun dogs even more. Mm -hmm. um, more importantly, because of my human psychology, I find it easier to teach people. Right. And I can get 
Minds, I did a webinar on mindset a while ago. And one thing that if you subscribe to the webinar now, I think there's about 15 or 16 recordings, like 16 months worth of live webinars, all fully recorded. And they're all, categories. They're all archived in the... All archived. You just go press webinar button, bang, all your webinars are on there. They're all categorized. You can look through them. I've got to sit for two hours into them. You can look at the things you want to look at. Um, so that, to me, is a massive learning tool. Yeah, that we offer. So yeah, so to get on, get on, and give it a try. And um, like I remember saying, I had a big celebrity, big A-list celebrity, and he said, "I don't know if I can do all this training, Ben. I'm, I'm bombarded with everything." And I said, "Have you got time to feed your dog twice a day?" Of course I have. I said, <laughs> "Right, I'm going to give you a few techniques. Do this twice a day, and it'll make a massive difference." That again, it sounds so easy, but it makes so much sense. It's easy. It, trust so me, easy. it's so easy. And in in it, all, it, it, I'm I'm repeating myself, but the people who think they need to try to hunt this dog at five months of age and shoot birds for it, they're really and they pay for it in the long run. And then then they do have to go get the e collar because they, if I ask you a question, if I ask you a question now. Mm -hmm. If you if you had a couple of those really good dogs again after speaking to me, yeah, would you do, would you do it differently? The answer is probably yes, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I told you tonight I'm going to start messing up. I'm going to start playing with the the food bowl. Um, yeah. And I yeah. and I'm going to have to kind of what I think your description of it was good. I'll probably have to get on the app and watch some of that. But it makes total sense. Like the most I ever did. And, and it's certainly it helps with a dog is when I open the door, they're not allowed to come out. Like when I have the whelping, I have like a whelping room here for the last litter. So when I open the door, they're not allowed to come out. And then they're allowed to come out when I say come out. When I put the food bowl down, I make them wait to eat. But I never thought of making the food bowl part of the, learn. you know, like all they learned was to sit and wait for me to say, okay, which is yeah. good. But I could rather, so rather, rather than say, yeah, rather than say, okay, why don't you go hook whistle? Why right. don't you say, why don't you put the bowl to the left or right and say out? Why don't you oh. put the bowl behind them and say back? Back, right. right. It's it's, common, I'm going to do sense. the same thing every day. So yeah. I did like one thing, and I could have mixed it up ten different ways. And how many, how many times in the U.S. would you see twenty kennels down there, twenty kennels down there, center corridor? A yep. guy or a lady with a, a trolley with bags of dog food on and a scoop. And they walk down the scoop and mm -hmm. they, spin, they spin the feeder and put, put the food in, spin it round. And that's how they feed the dogs. Right. So they're missing a massive opportunity. Right. They not get those 20 dogs out when, they're, when they've been trained individually and in, and in pairs, braces, in, in fours and fives. Get those 20 dogs out, make all 20 sit. Call right. them out individually, let them feed. When they fed individually, put them away. Get the next dog out of the group, make that one feed. You know, I'll, I'll have 10 to a dozen dogs all sat at the end of the kennel and I'll slide a bowl, let one eat. And when it finishes, I'll put it in the kennel. And the, other another ones are, the other ones are just waiting. All sat watching. Now, oh. if I can't get them to sit in the kennel, how on earth am I going to go on a pheasant shoot <laughs> on the weekend when right. there's thousands of birds being flushed over the guns and birds being shot everywhere and dogs everywhere and, and dogs everywhere. And I say, God, my dogs are so naughty. I can't even get them to sit for their food. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I don't know. You're, you're making uh you're, well, you're, you gave me a ton of stuff to think about. I think you're going to give the listeners a ton of stuff to think about. I hope so. I hope so. Um, <clears throat> and I think the most important thing of this when the listeners listen to this, I am using these techniques on my own dogs seven days a week, every single day of the month. Right. And it's working and it's all over the internet. My Instagram is all over my Facebook. I'm posting videos to show you that these techniques work. There's no hidden tricks. I'm not doing anything different. I'm just showing you the techniques that work. Right. That can help you. Yeah. No, I, 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 I'm just, yeah, my head's spinning. Like I'm I want to go get a new puppy now. Yeah. <laughs> I wanna I'll, I wanna start I'll send, you, 
you know, and I, and I, I, I trained one of my, my German wire hair pointers. I taught him, you know, like the baseball and the overs and backs. He was an easy dog, you know, but to think I could have been teaching that to him while he was just being my little bitty buddy and just eating two, three times a day would have saved me a lot of time on the back end. You know? Of course it would. Of yeah. course it would. And, and the transition to, to game and hunting would have been much more seamless. Right. And, you know, I also don't want anybody to think I, this is very common in the States. You will hear people talk about trial dogs that only trial and they never hunt. And not that there's opportunities all over the UK, but your dogs that are trialing are still hunting birds every day. So every when, day. I, when, the I season, think tr- when the season comes in, yeah. this is why I'm, this is what I was trying to explain. So in the US, let's say you've just got a big truck with loads of trialing dogs. They come out. You've got pigeons, hunt, flush, chuckers or pigeons. You're flushing them. You're practicing what you're going to do on the weekend, which is right. And you're winning trials. And then you want to go hunting on a quail farm. And the dog goes 150 yards. He's knackered. It's gone too fast. It's right. blowing itself up. Um, it's had multiple flushes on a covey. It doesn't know which one to mark. You send it. It goes off the whistle. They're not hunt. They're not shooting dogs. My shooting dogs do both disciplines. Right. So I shoot far more than I trial. Yeah. So even when I have my heyday, when I'm trialing, I'm only probably doing one a week because I prefer to go train, 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 win. Right. Trial, 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 train, train, trial, trial. Because I go, don't win, don't win, don't win, don't win. Train, train, train. Don't win, don't win, fluke it. Yeah. That's well, what happens. Well, I'm trying to picture a group of, let's say, your buddies that are all in the same world, right? Not all trialers, but trainers, hunters, a little bit of everything. Is it, do you take great delight in, like, picking on each other? Like, it's really famous here. Like, if somebody's dog acts like an idiot, well, we let them have it, right? Oh, in, well, rugby, rugby banter is as bad as it gets. Okay, so it's... It is, but, it's, it's obscene. So, so rugby really, banter is shooting banter, and they every, they get it from every angle they can possibly have it from. Okay, because I, I would get along good with that. But my picture is, if you do this with your next pup or your your dog now, and you want to hit the reset button, you will never have to live through your buddies just beating the death out of you verbally over a no. beer about how your dog does not listen and how your dog, you know, uh, it's just, yeah. Having that well-trained dog, like I said, I've, I will be honest. I've only had, I've had some good dogs. I, I would say I've had two that are well-trained and it is a good feeling. It's a darn good feeling to oh, give yourself two examples. Um, Ron goes out today with a, with a 12 bore and a box of cartridges in your pocket. And you've got a dog that you cast off and it's hunting, but it's taking a bit too much ground in. And you've told it off multiple times. It flushes a few birds. You've missed them because they're yep. too far. Yep. You've clipped one, injured it. The dog's chased it, not picked it. You've gone looking for it for 20 minutes, can't find it. You get back in the truck and go, oh, I didn't really enjoy that. Right. And then, then Ron gets out another dog the next day. He casts it off. It hunts beautifully under control. It flushes birds within gun range. It shoots it, it's steady, you pick it. It picks five beautiful birds for you. You've shot five cracking birds. I'm, you I'm, buying, drinks. I'm buying drinks for everybody. <laughs> and then you get back in the car and go, wow, what an experience, what a day that was. Yeah. I want to repeat that is for decades now to come. I want to show my children what this is like. This is an incredible sport. But Ron the day before is completely pissed off. Yeah. And how are you going to put it right? The shooting season started. All right. you would do is go and shoot more and more and it get worse and worse. Right, right. Yeah, that's uh okay. Last thing. You're you're you've experienced you've trained all different dogs from pet dogs to uh HRP. Your specialty, if you're known for, is cockers, but you've done a yeah. lot with, with springers and labs. Yeah, cockers and springers, yeah. Yeah. Really. 
what is the biggest is it really just the size is our cockers and spring this is just ron needed to ask this question i don't yeah. care if my audience is interested in it are are springers and cockers literally two different size dogs or are they really are they what's your opinion obviously they're doing exactly the same discipline okay they call the pattern flushing dogs birds within range retrieving them and handling them mm -hmm. um what I would say in the last 10 to 20 years, the, probably the last 10 years especially, the, excuse me, the Springer Spaniel has got a lot more biddable and a lot softer in nature. Okay. So they don't quite, they hunt hard and fast, but they're not as aggressive and not as natural on runners and natural at picking and natural at finding birds necessarily because they're quite soft and kind okay. however i actually really like that because i can nurture them and i can get them to be more confident and, and get that yeah. bond really well with them whereas a cocker they're basically little bastards okay so they're basically a terrier with a longer coat they want to kill everything and they want to kill it now right so but when they're doing it and they go wrong I tend to chuckle because they're so funny when they're doing it. <laughs> and it's almost like watching a stoat hunting in grass. It's fun, the most exciting thing to watch where a spaniel is going harder and faster because it's bigger. It's caught in the ground a bit wider and it's lovely to watch the power. But when you cast a cocker off and it's a small little nine, 10 kilo cocker, and it flushes a cockbird off its nose and it sits and the cockbird goes 50 yards and you shoot it and he goes straight out and grabs it and drags it back by its neck and gives it to you. That is a pretty magical feeling. Yeah. That, that animal has got a heart of a, a lion. Right. And quite, often, quite often my cockers will go and bring back a full size hare and I stand there with my arm at right angles above, and the, the ears are around my belly and the legs are touching the floor. It's a big old hair. My cockers will pick it better than my labs and my spaniels because they want it. So there's just something, they're just more gur. Oh, <laughs> just they do. More they just, gur. They just, yeah, they just want it. And to stand behind a cocker on rabbits or pheasants when it's when it's fully trained is the most phenomenal thing to watch and on the on the app I've, I've put two very special videos on there so i got the old video footage of me winning the championship live mm -hmm. as it was filmed and i muted the talking and i did my own talk over and explained how i won i think they're free on there those videos to download um which which was i just basically to stand behind her was incredible and all those dogs on those championships, to judge the championships is a massive honour, but to stand behind a dog that is going as hard as its four legs can physically move its body right. under brilliant control is just a pleasure to stand behind. Yeah. And I think in the UK, we've got some of the best trained dogs in the world putting in the most incredible temptations in front of them, but still maintaining incredible control and a partnership. So, yeah, I think if I had to pick one, it would be a cocker because yeah. I need to laugh a bit. And if you laugh, you enjoy yourself. <laughs> I love it. It's a great way to wrap it up. Now, Ben, are you coming to the States anytime soon or do I have to come to England to meet you in person? You probably have to come to England initially, um, okay. but I do, I, I do want to come back over. It's just two boys playing sport, running businesses. Um, right. It's, we are looking at doing it and I want to do a tour of America. I've been asked by so many people to come and do like a, a whole, like a six month tour and just go around and just teach my methods to everybody. I'd love to do that. Um, and I think one day um, in, the, in the, in the near future, I think I'd like to have a whole six month out and just come to the U S and just travel around and just book seminars all over the country. Well, I'm not going to wait for that then. I think I'm going to be, coming out to see you next spring or summer. What's the, what's yeah. the best time to come out and, and spend some time short of the gun season. But I mean, that's a whole nother, just to yeah. see what, what's the I best. Think, I think the spring, the spring's good. The spring before it gets too, before it gets too hot. Sort of March, April, May time is really good. 
Um, the dogs have had a whole season. Uh, they've had a whole of February off to rest and ailments get better and bruises and scratches. And then we start to slowly train them again in March. And we look at all the things that went wrong during the season. And we we got months now to put them all right again. Well, then, uh, as my wife texted me a minute ago to see if I was done with this. So I will let this go. Um, but I'm going to, when I go in the house, I'm going to tell her that uh, we might be we might be going to the UK here in uh, in March then. You know, I can set up some lovely stuff here. It'd be fantastic to see you. How far, how far north of, like, you know, I've only been there once and it was just London and the near countryside. How far are you from like London proper? Two and a half hours. Okay. I, I, I didn't do real good with the steering wheel on the other side of the vehicle. No. Uh, I, and the little cars. Yeah. It's the little cars. And I, at one point, my wife said, she goes, would you be upset if we just brought the rental car back and spent the next two days back in the city? And <laughs> like, I'm good. I'm good with that. But I want to go. I want to see you, your dogs. Um, I want to, I just, I'll bring, of course, I'll bring the recording equipment. And, uh, and I want to find a couple more of those English pubs that my wife and I found where the ceilings are only about five foot, nine inches tall, where I could, I had to duck my head a little bit, you know. Exactly. So and we, we find a couple of couple of pubs like that, boy, it would make my day. Well, we've got very, very good country pubs around here. We've got uh, real owls, so beautiful owls, like dark ones, smooth ones, light, light owls. Mm. But we're quite famous for our cider. So um, you don't sell much cider in America, but we got some fabulous cider here. So um, the ales, I'll yeah. stick with the ales. But yeah, um, and my wife would probably take anything that's got a higher alcohol content. Yeah, gin and tonic. She like we sort of a gin. Yeah, tonic. yeah, she'd be a gin and tonic. Ran, ran, blah, ben, I can't thank you enough for for doing this. I know it took us a while to do it. It had to kind of fit into my schedule is easy. That's why I'm going to visit you because I'm retired and why not? But uh, if, if you don't mind, I would, I, I, I'm going to kind of organize. I know a couple of my patrons are actually on your webinars. I'll start hitting your webinars more often. And at some point I would, and I know schedules are hard to do again, but once a month or once every three weeks, I do a Patreon Zoom room with the, the people who are patrons of mine that literally, you know, give me a few dollars a month. They get some discounts, but we, we get on a Zoom like your your webinar, and we just talk about dog training. We talk about where we're hunting. Some people have a question. You get a lot of good opinions. I would love if you could make it some some Thursday night in the future, Definitely. and, and come on because I think uh, it would uh, it it would be a game changer. It would be a game changer. Well, let's let's book, let's book me in for Thursday. Send me some dates when you I'll think it'd be good, and I'll, and I'll join you on a Thursday night and have a beer. All right. That sounds good. Cause I'm going to go. Is it four o'clock yet? Oh yeah. I can have a beer. Yeah. Good man. I'm going to go and have one now. Let my dogs out and get another beer. All right. Thanks okay. again. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for listening. And I, I hope it, I hope the things I've said helped and okay. um, keep training. Enjoy your feet, feed times. Feed times. That's it. It's all about breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> Quite right. All Cheers, right. Buddy.